Peter Kiernan is with us, the entrepreneur, philosopher, philanthropist, former partner at Goldman Sachs, author of the book American Mojo, Lost and Found, Restoring Our Middle Class Before the World Blows By. His website, Peter D. Kiernan, K-I-E-R-N-A-N.com. Peter, uh, welcome to the program. So nice to be with you today. Thank you. What is the state of our middle class right now? I think our middle class is getting crushed and we need to take and make a concerted effort as a nation to bring them back. Okay. How, how badly are we being crushed and when did this start? Well, it really started back in the 1970s and I'll use as a, as a bright red line the Arab oil embargo crisis. Back then oil was a whopping $3 a barrel if you can imagine such a thing. But that was when there was a disconnect between productivity enhancements that corporations enjoyed and the wages that workers who created those productivity enhancements participated in. So you're starting to see flat wages since 1970. Well, it's been largely since 78, hasn't it? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. I said I, said, I thought it was largely since 78. Well, I, if, you, if you look at it uh, in the early 70s, we really have seen almost no growth in wages uh-huh. since that time. Okay. And, and what, what is frustrating for so many people is that the relevant costs of being in the middle class, those are health care, medicine, education, housing, energy, you get the picture. Those have all had double digit or certainly higher than inflation rate increases in costs. So here you have this wedge that's being created and the middle class has been trying desperately to fill it in. Yeah. You know, the middle class used to have you know, basically, when you, when you got out of high school or you got out of college, it wasn't, am I going to find a job? It was, which of these jobs am I going to pick? Um, my dad, you know, came back after World War II or after the Japanese occu- the occupation of Japan and uh, ended up working 40 years in a t- tool and die shop and made enough money to pay, out, pay off his house, you know, raised four boys, uh, uh, took a vacation every year, uh, bought a new car every couple of years. That used to be the American dream. Died debt free. His house was paid off. He he had uh, you know a pension that my mom lived on until she died. That's a very different scenario than we have now. You know, with Reagan selling us this whole idea of IRAs and four hundred one ks and the shift away from pensions and and the 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 war on labor unions that was declared by Reagan. We've gone from roughly a third of Americans being unionized uh, when Reagan came into office to now. Uh, you know, under 7% in the private sector. What, what can we do to recover this stuff? Well, you've talked about something very important, which is that when your father, God bless him, did all those wonderful things, the government, the banks, the regulators, everybody was sort of lined up behind him and a lot of other men and women like him who had participated in the war or grew up in that era. Right now, the federal government, until some of the things that are actually happening as recently as today, has basically been ignoring the middle class, almost like a non-benign neglect, figuring it's a natural course of order that we're gonna have a strong middle class, when in fact, that was never the case. It was well orchestrated back in your father's day, and it's not well orchestrated today, and we're getting expected results. This is, this is something that I think most Americans uh, don't understand. Just, you know, this, it's kind of Econ 101. Uh, Adam Smith talked about it in Wealth of Nations, um, probably more to the point, um, Oh, what's his name? The Economist in uh, 1807 who wrote On Labor, um, whose name is escaping me. Anyhow, uh, it, it's... It, 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 what's his name? But I, yeah, I, I good old what's his name. Is that a middle... If you're looking at a capitalist society, an unregulated capitalist society, middle classes are rare. Uh, they, are, they are not the normal outcome of a middle class... Of an of a unregulated capitalist society or of a crony capitalism society. I mean, if you, if you look at the writings of Thomas uh, or of, uh, uh, of Dickens, right? Dickens was, was, I mean, his father went to a debtor's prison. He literally was writing about the England that he really and truly knew. And when you look at A Christmas Carol, you know, Scrooge, uh, Scrooge and Marley, these guys, those were the middle class. Here's a small business with one employee, right? That guy, Scrooge, was the middle class. 
Cratchit, Bob Cratchit, was the working poor, which was more than 90% of England at the time. Um, the, the middle class was maybe 5% because it was the professional class and the mercantilists, you know, the doctors, the lawyers, and the shop owners, basically. And then every, and, you, know, and then you had the very, very wealthy. You had the, the royal family and you had the, the retainers of the royal family, basically, the landed gentry, you know, who were very, very wealthy. And that's the normal state of an economy. You've got to change the rules of capitalism in order for a middle class to emerge, as as FDR did in the 30s. And they stood up until Reagan really, well, Carter, I'd say in 78, Carter started aggressively deregulating industries. But it was really Reaganism, in my opinion, that, that just took this whole thing apart. Your thoughts? Well, I think I've worked my whole life in business. And I will tell you something, having visited thousands of enterprises, I can tell you with certainty that capitalism, this is the, sort of the secret of capitalism, left to its own, capitalism is the greatest peacetime wealth concentrator ever imagined. Well, I would, I would agree if you were to say free enterprise. I, I don't. I don't agree with that on cap. I, I've started seven businesses. Uh, the the largest one I started, uh, we sold in '86 when it was a six million dollar company. It was recently sold to to a billion dollar company for for a little less than that. Uh, it, it we generated over a quarter billion dollars in revenue. Um, you know, I've done pretty good in my life, and and I never used capital to start these. I was never a capitalist. I was always an entrepreneur. Um, that, that particular business, it was, it was called International Wholesale Travel. We started in Atlanta in 1983 with a, either ten dollars or $15,000 line of credit that I had on my American Express card. That, I agree, will build things. But for people like Mitt Romney to sit around, you know, the ultimate capitalist, and throw money at companies just so that they can merge and lay off their, their uh, now redundant uh, sales and, and accounting staffs so that, so that Romney and his buddies can make more money off it, uh, that to me seems parasitic, not not helpful. Well, let's let's run with that point because I think what you're describing is um, kind of the infrastructure of the ecosystem we're we're creating in this country to create the businesses that you created and that other people created. Right now, every minute of every day, a woman starts a business in this country. Yet, seventy percent of venture capital goes to men. And if you look at the cradle of job creation, it is these small businesses that you're describing. And what are we doing as a nation to enhance the creation of these small enterprises? What nurturing things are we doing? Are we so hung up on feeding these giant corporations that are, oh, have me, many, many avenues and accesses? Yeah, to let me tell you about it. We, we started an ad agency in Atlanta in 1987 um, when we came back from Germany after having sold the travel business. And, and built it up and had, you know, a whole bunch of Fortune 500 clients, and it was doing really well. And we were up to 18 employees, and, and we were making good money. And I went to the bank, and I said, you know, I want to get an SBA loan. I, you know, I'd like to get a couple hundred thousand dollar line of credit here to grow this company to the next step. Um, technology was moving really, really rapidly in, in things like typesetting and layout and design and stuff. And they were like, you know, this is a small business not interested in company your size. You know, they're not interested in a million dollar business. They, you, you got to be a, 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 you know, if you're a five hundred million dollar business, call us back. Yeah, it was I knew astonishing. It's it's absolutely true that we have to dial the focus, just as we did after World War II. By the way, dial the focus to the point where real wealth is created. Uh, today's an interesting day to talk about this because there's an organism you may not like much, and most people don't, that is going to go out of its. Uh, uh, ability to do business today, and that's the 81-year-old Export-Import Bank, the Exim Bank. Right. Now, the Exim Bank was started with a very simple premise, how to help small businesses in the United States export overseas. Right, how and it's now, now its biggest client is Boeing. <laughs> right. No, I understand, I understand your point. Peter, I'm sorry we're out of time, but I, I, you know, I understand your point. The, the problem, though, with that is that all these other countries have their own Exim banks, and but, but yes, it's, there are 60 of them in the world, right? Yeah, this is a tough one. You can read all about it. Peter Kiernan's new book, American Mojo, Lost and Found. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.